Sisters, brothers, siblings in Christ, grace and peace to you from the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. To be perfectly honest, I do not want to be up here today. I want to be here today, but I don't want to be up here today. I am sick and tired of having to find something pastoral to say to people after a mass shooting event. Frankly, when I'm not feeling powerless, I have too much hot anger and frustration and snark to be pastoral. What I want to do is knock some heads in hopes of instilling some common sense in particular in certain politicians, but I know that will only land me in jail, and that those politicians are so hard-headed and hard-hearted that I don't think they are capable of internalizing even a little bit of common sense. For example, Texas Governor Abbott said that anyone who shoots at a school is mentally ill, period. That was a quote. Shooting up a school is not a matter of mental illness, but a matter of ethics, and morality of right and wrong. While mental illness can play havoc in someone's ethics and morals, very few mass shooters are mentally ill. Many may have depression, or be in a dark place emotionally, or maybe just plain scared due to manipulation or disinformation, but that is not the same as having the disease of, say, schizophrenia. Otherwise, most politicians should have already been removed from office for the mental illness of uh, playing politics. Amen. I told you I'm full of snark. And I haven't even begun. In the latest surveys, 80 to 90 percent of Americans agree that our political leaders need to enact common sense gun legislation. The kind that has been enacted in every single industrial nation in this world which has a fraction of the gun violence that we have in this nation, with over 10 mass shootings per week. That's more than one a day, folks. Some argue that guns are not the problem. People are the problem. That is both true and utterly misleading. If there were no guns, there would be no gun violence. But because we are flawed, weak human beings, there would still be violence. But someone attacking with a knife is significantly less likely to commit mass murder than someone with an AR-15 semi-automatic rifle that can spray 15 to 20 bullets per second. Someone attacking with a knife is much easier to subdue than a gun. Some argue that we need not less guns, but more guns. That a good guy with a gun can stop a bad guy with a gun. Well, both Parkland and Uvalde have proven that argument utterly false. There were guards or police at both school locations, and they didn't stop the gunmen from killing many children and teachers. Some argue that teachers should therefore be armed. This idea is so full of holes it can't even begin to hold water, not only because of the fallacies of logic, but because of the negative unintended consequences. First, you can't expect teachers, let alone schools, to deal with men armed with weapons of war. That's a soldier's job, not a teacher's job. And hardening schools so that they become like military bunkers will only create more emotional problems for children. Second, those people that are arguing that teachers should be armed with deadly weapons are generally the same people who are arguing that teachers can't be trusted with dangerous weapons called books. <laughs> uh -huh. Amen. Third, teachers are people too. It would just be a matter of time before a teacher loses their cool and shoots a child. Fourth, children are people too. It is just a matter of time before a child succeeds in getting a hold of a teacher's weapon and shoots another child, or the teacher, or themselves. Fifth, given the mental health crisis that exists in children these days, it would be just a matter of time before a suicidal child acts so that they die, not by suicide by cop, but suicide by teacher. 
more guns will not result. More guns will result in more problems. More violence, not less. Eliminating guns won't end violence. But passing sensible gun regulation will help significantly curb gun violence, just as it has in every single industrialized nation in the world. Reducing economic and social inequality is also a significant factor in reducing violence in general. At the same time, such legislation won't be enacted until politicians love children more or that their love for children exceeds their fear of not being elected or re-elected, and their fear of the federal government taking away people's rights and freedoms. Of course, those same politicians don't seem to care that the dead have already lost their rights and freedoms because, well, they're dead, and therefore can't even exercise their right, or excuse me, their freedom, to vote. This is supposed to be a sermon and not a rant. So I suppose I should bring this back around to Jesus and the cross. In his last words to his disciples that we heard today, before he would be arrested and crucified, put to death, Jesus prayed that his disciples would be completely one, just as he and the Father are one. This oneness is not about sameness, about everyone having the same thoughts and opinions, same likes and dislikes. This oneness is not about there being no differences and therefore no conflict. That's what some tried to argue in the early church, that all the Gentiles joining the, the community of believers had to adopt Jewish ways and practices, like circumcision and eating kosher foods. You can read about that debate in more depth if you want to in Acts chapter 15. But basically that argument was rejected because the community's oneness was not dependent upon cultural and social sameness, but upon the relationship that they all shared in Jesus. It was the connectedness that mattered because it was a gift from God and not based on human achievement. Jesus' ministry was all about helping people understand and live out that connectedness in their daily lives with God, their neighbor, and themselves. The trouble was that various people saw that message as a threat to their rules and therefore their power and privilege about who should be connected and why. In other words, some people wanted a certain purity standard because Jesus wouldn't relent, but held fast to God's more expansive vision grounded in grace and not human purity achievements that cut Jesus off by crucifying him. As such, whenever we cut people off, and I don't mean on the streets when we're driving, whenever we participate in polarization, we are cutting Jesus off. We are denying that Jesus is connected to that other person. In effect, we are denying Jesus. The good news is that we are connected to God and each other as a gift. The question now is, how can we be witnesses to this connectedness in the midst of the people of a world hell-bent on tearing itself 